super excited to see this uh, group again. I learned a lot about eDNA at our last uh, conversation, so I'm excited to present a new topic today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our two speakers for the Salish Seed Roundtable. We've got Karen Hunter, who's our program lead in the Marine Spatial Ecology Analysis Group, and Kaya Bruce was supporting Karen via casual and some contracts with various projects, including the paper that today's seminar is based on. Um, Karen usually leads the climate response program with a key role in highlighting the importance of including climate change considerations in all DFO programs and management plans. Many of the projects are rooted in the Aquatic Climate Change and Adaptation Services Program priorities, recognizing that climate change adaptation needs to be part of most programs. And there's a considerable challenge to achieve integration within the department and with our many collaborators. Karen and her team are developing novel frameworks and tools using risk assessment and trait analysis methods to identify, evaluate, and fill key gaps in support of climate planning and decision making in fisheries and oceans management in an ever-changing climate. Currently, Karen's on assignment uh, within the National Capital Region, but is joining us today. I'd invited Karen and Kai today to speak about their recent publication, Enhancing Climate Change Planning and Ad Adaptive Management in Marine Protected Areas Through Targets, Thresholds, and Social Ecological Objectives, which was recently published in the Frontiers of Marine Science. Marine protected areas are being created globally in an effort to protect biodiversity. We look forward to learning about gaps and challenges of implementing climate change in an adaptive management framework and welcome both of them to our talk today. Uh, this group was created as a way for science on both sides of the border to have a forum to learn and discuss key science and ecological questions within the Salish Sea. Having the last several years with record high temperatures, heat domes, fires and even floods, I think climate change is certainly on the radar for all of us in and around the Salish Sea. So welcome, uh, Karen and Kaya. Uh, for questions, we'll leave those to the end of the presentation. And if folks can mute their microphone and turn their cameras off to prepare uh, to preserve bandwidth other than our presenters. And then we look forward to hearing from you during our Q&A session. So with that, I'll turn it over to Karen and Kai. Thanks. Thank you, Cher, for that really warm welcome. And I'm excited to have a conversation after as well. Um, today, Kai Bryce and I will present a summary of two linked original research projects that explore how biological conservation efforts are explicitly incorporating climate change and adaptation principles into MPA management and monitoring efforts around the world. Next slide. It is quite old news that Earth systems, as we have known them or measured them, are changing. And with those changes come instability for the natural systems that support humanity. We now know that the ocean has absorbed an estimated 90% of the energy in the climate system in the form of heat. And the ocean also absorbs carbon and other atmospheric outfall through deposition. This results, as you know, in ocean warming, climate extreme events, acidification, deoxygenation, among other physical effects and biogeochemical effects. And there's also ever mounting evidence of ecological and biological responses to these changing conditions, not to mention some of the social pieces. So for the majority of its existence, applied science and management have considered the environment as a stationary or stable background feature of natural systems. However, because of in the environment strongly affects life on earth, we are really faced now with a justifiable critique of the efficacy of our existing science advice and management tools given their static nature. Some of us are probably stock assessment people or you know, various different tools that we implement in our organizations and know this very well. The good news is that we can address how our knowledge is integrated into decision processes to inform management. So we've got a lot of bandwidth and I think a lot, a lot of really cool, cool avenues going forward. And you know, really the, the response and the effectiveness of that response includes being proactive in this adaptation space. Next slide. The not so good news, unfortunately, is that climate driven changes in the ocean are compounded with other human pressures on natural systems with significant impacts on biodiversity. This is driving global marine conservation efforts, including the establishment of protections for 30% of the coastal ocean, and if unaccounted for, the changing climate may undermine those efforts. And despite that, 
integration of climate change adaptation into marine conservation and marine protected areas has been relatively limited. So Kaya and I are gonna to refer to marine protected areas as MPAs in the remainder of this conversation. And we'll also refer to the climate robustness index likely as the CRI from time to time to save ourselves a few tongue twisters. Next slide. So to begin to get a better understanding of this really big issue, uh, a few years ago now, my research program provided the first comprehensive global evidence of how climate change was being explicitly considered in MPA management plans around the world. In a few moments, Kai will present the most recent work based on this paper or off this paper. Uh, but first I'll outline um, a, the method a bit further. So, and I'd really like to share two of our main results from this work so you can see, you know, what we initially learned before we dive into some, some of the um, additional questions that, that uh, Kaya and my paper actually achieved. Next slide. So to begin, our team collected MPA management plans from around the world, and we were able to assess fully using the Climate Change Robustness Index 223 plans in total. We built off existing literature to develop a scoring approach that quantified the degree of implementation of climate adaptation planning in MPA management plans. And we also linked, the, the, the importance of that is that it links adaptive management into MPA planning in a change, changing climate. We called this approach the Climate Robustness Index. It is comprised of 12 questions that ask about climate, in, climate change integration and the incorporation of adaptation, um, adaptive management principles into management frameworks. And to arrive at an index, we scored each question by assigning points to information within the plans and then summed the score. It's a very straightforward assessment um, that is transparent um, and repeatable. Slide seven. Um, as I indicated, the Climate Robustness Index, the CRI, is linked to adaptive, the adaptive management cycle. And this cycle is adopted by the majority of MPAs and supports an explicit and iterative process to enable uh, adaptive decisions. Each component of the cycle, as we've laid out here, is um, essential to develop the information that is necessary to make informed management interventions where this cycle is, is applied. And in a sense, uh, adaptive management treats management strategies as revisable and, respons and responsive, where the performance of objectives and strategies are regularly assessed relative to a desired condition by monitoring key in indicators and limits around those conditions. And all this is, is clearly outlined. And I have a feeling that um, having read some of the Salish Sea reports and, and um, I'm forgetting the name of them at this very moment, this is very much a process that some of you would be extremely uh, expert in, frankly, even more than, than I am myself. Um, although, and I was, I'm saying this because you'll know that this cycle is not super simple to achieve. Um, however, MPAs have largely adopted it as, the, as a decision support system. Um, and that's indicated in many of the management plans that we were able to look at over the last number of years. Next slide, please. So going back to the Oregon et al. publication from 2021, this is the first result I'd like to share. And this figure um, of the world map shows the overall results of the Climate Robustness Index. So you get a general sense of where the plans came from and the number of plans based on the size of the circle and, and the color of the circle. Um, but the main message here really is that globally MPA management plans written in English did not score very well using the CRI, achieving an average score of only 39%. Next slide. We also looked at the CRI over time for four countries with sufficient data to conduct a trend analysis. And while the majority showed evidence of increasing the incorporation of climate change adaptation principles in their management plans over time, this was not consistent across countries or MPA designations. In 2023, an author team led by Lubikansky showed that there is indirect consideration of climate change in MPA planning, but consistent formalization of actions in planning remains incomplete based on Oregon et al. 2021. As you can imagine, these results gave our team plenty of reasons to ask and investigate additional questions related to climate change planning for biodiversity conservation. And I'm, in a moment, I'm going to pass it to Kaya um, so she can present the next slides um, on the newest research. 
But the last thing I, I really want to say is that the CRI was developed to be a helpful tool and to help guide practitioners and researchers in the proactive management of MPAs. And we are really um, partners in delivering marine biodiversity protection in the face of environmental change. Thanks, Karen. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kaya Bright. Um, I joined Karen's research team to look at the climate robustness of MPA monitoring plans. Um, assessing MPA management plans with the CRI raised additional questions relating to climate change planning in MPAs. And we assumed that MPA monitoring plans might contain different and more detailed information and have a greater emphasis on elements of the CRI, such as targets, thresholds, and metrics. We located 41 English language MPA monitoring plans from the regions indicated on this map. And this collection of monitoring plans is smaller than what was assessed by Oreg et al. But it also aligns with findings um, by Gill et al. in 2017 that found that only 13% of MPAs globally actually use the results of scientific monitoring to guide their management. So with our monitoring plans, we calculated their respective climate robustness scores using the index, and we explored relationships between certain NPA traits and their CRI score. We found that the mean climate robustness score for monitoring plans was 60%, which was higher than the 39% found in management plans scored by Oregon et al. But we found consistent gaps in climate robustness between NPA management and monitoring plans across the 12 robustness questions, which effectively rejected our assumptions around the contents of monitoring plans. So this figure lays out the CRI scores for management plans on the left and monitoring plans on the right. And on the y-axis, I've listed the components of the index and their scores listed on the, the x-axis. Um, so as you can see, we found consistent patterns in both the highest scoring elements and the lowest scoring elements of the index. The three highest scoring elements were indicators, a discussion of the baseline conditions and a commitment to monitoring. And it was good news to learn that both, like in both types of plan, there was a strong commitment to monitoring for climate change. And that in all of the plans that we scored, indicators were being included or plan, planned to be included. The lowest scoring components were the thresholds, targets, a discussion of sociological climate impacts, and climate change objectives. The low scores in these areas reveal some interesting opportunities moving forward. We also explored relationships between climate robust scores and five MPA traits the conservation focus, the level of protection, the IUCN category, their area, and their governance level. So we used an inventory of traits for American MPAs and plotted the cumulative climate robustness scores of MPA management and monitoring plans, along with governance arrangement for those MPAs. And we found that MPAs designated and managed as a partnership clustered around a higher mean CRI score than those managed at a single level, of governance. So this suggested to us that while all governance levels were achieving some level of climate adaptive management, there might be an advantage to partnerships. The advantage of partnerships was also supported by the fact that in most of the plans that we examined, um, they described relationships with external organizations to execute their operations. The low representation of these four factors, targets, thresholds, sociological dimensions, and climate change object objectives, suggests that there are opportunities to support better adaptive management of MPAs, while the comparatively higher performance of MPAs managed as a partnership represents a strength to lean into as we think about ways to increase, to improve climate robustness. In the next slides, we'll be talking about the potential for strengthening climate adaptive MPA planning by setting targets and thresholds to establish decision criteria and performance measures, and integrating social dimensions and climate change objectives by creating social ecological objectives.
Targets and thresholds are good characteristics of the management system because without these limits, we can end up observing changes to systems that are undesirable, but lack the mechanisms to intervene. So for this reason, targets and thresholds are essential to fulfilling the adaptive management cycle. They help distill broad goals and objectives to comparable numbers to facilitate structured decision-making and accountability. In the review of MPA management and monitoring plans, we found some examples of clear targets and operational thresholds. And in addition to ecological ones, we, we saw some development around social ecological targets and thresholds in some MPAs. And in our publication, we highlighted one example of an MPA in Belize that's been making progress in this area. And this is really important territory to explore because we know that social and ecological systems are interlinked and that that relationship has important consequences for MPA success. Conservation is a social ecological endeavor and we recognize that we can't fully consider ecology without considering its social context and vice versa. However, in evaluating our set of MPA monitoring plans, we found two patterns that didn't track with a social ecological approach to conservation. Social information relating to climate change was poorly represented, while physical and ecological vulnerabilities to climate pressures were frequently discussed. This leaves out many unaddressed vulnerabilities and potential possibilities associated with MPA planning. Social information and values were often not explicitly stated in MPA objectives, but they were generally implied. And this was particularly clear in plans that, for example, sanctioned certain human activities within their boundaries or protected economically important species. In our paper, we explored two main suggestions to address these findings around social considerations in MPA, MPA planning in tandem with developing climate change objectives. So first, explore and articulate social ecological objectives within the planning framework. By spelling out a diversity of MPA objectives, including social ones, the MPA may be more likely to enjoy continued support, even if climate impacts compromise certain specific objectives. Within the context of an MPA, there are manageable and unmanageable pressures. Local human pressures are more manageable than global climate pressures, but their impacts can be compounding. Sentner et al. provides a good example of this in an MPA around a coral reef, which was being degraded both by wear and tear from core diving practices and deoxygenation associated with climate change. These impacts were compromising ecological objectives, as well as social ones, such as tourism appeal. And managing diving operations to reduce wear and tear from tourism reduces some of the total pressures on this reef. Integrating ecological and social elements allows both dimensions of an MPA to be managed as well as appreciated. Our second suggestion is to continue to expand partnerships to support climate adaptive MPA management and monitoring. The value in integrating local stakeholders and rights holders in designating and managing effective MPAs is widely accepted, both for functional and moral reasons. And 71% of the monitoring plans that we looked at referenced involvement of external groups in monitoring efforts. So we have potentially already made a lot of good ground on this opportunity. There's also strong academic support for marine management strategies that combine the responsiveness of local responsiveness and local accountability of community-based management with the analytical power and of high-level data management and regional coordination. Finally, there are myriad benefits of inviting, fostering, or restoring a stewardship ethic among communities within or adjacent to protected areas who are the ones that will most immediately feel the effects of conservation initiatives, both the positive and negative. Adapting to change requires engaging with risks, impacts, and consequences. And we have a choice as to how we engage, whether it's passive, reactive, or proactive. We see the need for a proactive, transparent, locally engaged, and scientific approach to marine conservation management. 
and the gaps highlighted by the Climate Robustness Index represent opportunities to proactively integrate climate adaptive management principles. We suggest establishing decision criteria in the form of targets and thresholds and creatively engaging with the social dimensions of MPAs to strengthen the resilience of this conservation tool. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Gaia, Karen, fantastic. Um, and thank you for leaving lots of time for Q&A, which is great. Um, we'll let people put up their hands. We'll, we'll monitor the chat as well, but if people um, want to have their, their smiling faces in front of the camera, that'd be great. Um, while we're just waiting for some hands up, I know there's some questions in the chat already, but I just had a quick question on IUCN categories for someone who's not in the MPA lingo. What does that mean? Oh, yes, sorry. IUCN stands for International Union on the Conservation of Nature, and they set up various designation for different levels of um, protected areas. So whether they are fully exclusive of any human activity or whether they might be more open to various human engagements with the ecosystem. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, we, all, we all get into our um, acronyms and <laughs> you're not in that field sometimes. Yeah. What is that one? I, uh, I was going, oh God, what does it stand for? So thank you, Kyle. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, good job, guys. <laughs> Save the day, right? Okay. Um, okay, so it, I don't see, I'm all, also just takes me a minute to get used to uh, Zoom over Teams, but there are some questions in the chat. So maybe I'll just. Um, uh, I saw some them. comments coming up that looked interesting. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll start with a question from uh, Sandra. Um, could you further explain how the CRI defined climate change related indicators? Did MPAs need to specifically monitor for the effects of climate change or would they, or could they incorporate climate change into their monitoring of other MPA outcomes? Yeah, I think maybe Kaya, we could back up in the slides and show the results. Um, where that's the management plans and the monitoring plans, if that's possible. It was it's always a, a question of how much detail and um and <laughs> do you provide versus how much text. So the 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 indicators were um, really you know, are, are you looking at indicators, but they weren't, they weren't necessarily specific, um, specifically linked to a, a climate indicator. Um, but there was, yeah, from, th that's, that's what I'm remembering about this. It's been a while yeah, since I've looked had at a our, list, yeah. We had a list of indicators that could be considered climate change indicators, that yeah. if they recognize those within the monitoring plan as things that they were looking out for. Yeah. So things like sea temperature, sea level, even if they didn't say we are monitoring sea temperature in order to track climate change, um, we considered those as part of yeah. monitoring for climate yeah. change. And often some funds would have an explicit statement saying that that was one of the goals um, was to track change due to climate change. Yeah, it, it, there was a bit of an interpretation around that. Um, but yeah, most of the time it was relatively clear in terms of the types of indicators. We, and we, we have this list, like I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm thinking about the list that we've pulled out, you know, the indicators, we've pulled out the targets, we've pulled out the thresholds to try to really get an understanding of, does the indicator link to a target? Does the, it's this, this big um, exercise that I think has still, lots of work that could be done around sharing what were the specific indicators, what were, and we've done some effort in this paper that Kaya has now just presented around some good examples of targets. Um, you know, you can look at the UK strategy and you can look at this MPA from Belize um, where they're, they're digging into things um, in terms of, you know, a full adaptive management cycle. But there are, there are, as you can see on this figure, there's lots of indicators being explored. Many of them overlap. Um, but yeah, the effort to share that information is, is something that I, I really want to get back to. And I think that I saw a question around, could, could you share the scores 
Um, yes, absolutely. Um, maybe share if that's the next question. I don't want to jump too much forward, but yeah, no, I, no, that, I think there's a lot fair. of detail yeah. here that that could be really useful to um, to people who are practitioners, particularly. Yeah, we've got a couple other <clears throat> questions. Um, so I had a question which I think is going to roll into to Ray's question, but I'll, I'll start with Ray's first. Oh, sorry, this is just kind of every time a new one slides in it. Um, so what category do you see education, like the public and students falling into here? And I, I, I'm going to give you a two-parter question of challenging you, the, the missing social component, which seems to be, you know, one of the ones that you've identified here. Is that because the people running these processes are not the public, et cetera, it's mostly science practitioners? Are we missing that socio component yeah. because of that? So yeah, sort of a two-parter there. Where do you see the public and educators fitting in and why do you think there is such a gap on the socio side of things? Um, well, I, I think Kyle, if I'll take a stab, but I think you know you, you would also be able to help answer that. Um, I mean, the discussion of the social uh, sociological climate impacts is certainly where in these documents they can sometimes link to these external groups if there's established relationships and there's programs that are happening. Of course, like the, there's no template for these documents, so they do vary in what they look right. like quite a bit. And there's there's no requirement to like check we talk to, right? So, so that's where I would think that that's where that information would often show up. And that's why we, we were gleaning these for, you know, specific information about the, the pieces that would link to the social system. Um, I didn't I think to ask the question specifically about education. Um, I'd have to think about that a little bit more in terms of whether or not that was really, it wasn't really a focus. But it was I one think, of the things that we looked yeah. at within the objectives of certain MPAs. And some of them right. do explicitly say that this MPA, like within their um, their yeah. long list of objectives and goals for the MPA, they do have education. In, in, in some cases, education was listed as, yeah. as one of the um, objectives. Um, whether or not that was specifically tied to education around climate change was Right. Vary, but if it was, then we would have we would have um, linked yeah. that with the sociological climate um, impacts discussion. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of like reading through and then interpreting whether or not something was being explicitly linked with with climate change um, because the language varied a lot in the plans. If only they had your matrix for evaluation before they wrote it, it would have been easier. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't, and I, I don't know if we answered the second half of your question, Cher. Yeah, um, just, yeah, wondering like what, like I mean, it's it looks like it's a pretty big gap on there. Is it because of the people at the table don't right. think like that, or like it, it, maybe the ones where there is more partners involved, it it gets better because of the you range. Know, it, if if I'm not mistaken, and I I could be mistaken, but if I'm not mistaken, my um view on the types of plans that we looked at. And where they came from was driving some of that. And so, for example, in Canada, our MPA management system and our science system has a very strong ecological focus. And, and now we're bringing in the physical, right? It's catching up. Um, and we, we haven't quite gotten to the place. And we're, we're working on this, of course, through a variety of initiatives in our other sectors outside of science and, in, of course, with reconciliation and the incorporation of indigenous knowledge in various forms and places. So I think that's also coming, but currently Canada, um, more of the United States, there's various places that are sort of more Western science dominated generally that have an ecological focus. And a lot of our plans are written in English, right? And so we have that viewpoint on this where we do have examples like the Belize example um, there is more of a social component and it may be a geopolitical type thing. Um, and I, I suggest people look at the Lopakansky paper. Um, I could provide the link after, um, but they looked at nine languages and they were looking at implicit incorporation of climate change. And so I, I really like that paper. It was a follow-up to the O'Regan because they were like, hey, you know, this is included in other places. And 
and thumbs up, like really great that we generated some thinking around this to identify explicit and implicit, right? And it's now it's about getting into the a, a revision of these plans to, I think, improve how we are communicating and how we are integrating these ideas and really, you know, the risk of climate change and the consequences that we're trying to avoid. So I think in general, this raised a lot of questions uh, for us, but also for researchers elsewhere that are now either trying to fill in some of the gaps that we obviously have in the work um, and and leading to more to more questions too, so. Awesome, thanks, Karen. So I got a couple other questions here, um, uh, from one from Scott. He's interested in how objectives and targets might change over time, which I guess is um, sort of the idea of an adaptive management framework is that those can change over time. But mm -hmm. I, I think some of the questions as, as the habitat suitability changes, as species recover, like when when are those things triggered and do they work in that adaptive mm -hmm. framework? I have some ideas, but Kaya, do you want to take a stab at that question first? Sure. Yeah, it's very much linked to why we need to take an adaptive approach to managing because things are changing and we don't know how they're going to change in the future. Um, and that was also part of um, our discussion on diversifying the objectives of an MPA, because if you have an MPA that has one very specific objective um, and with climate change, for example, if the MPA is, is um, conserving a site for um, seabird breeding and with climate change, the seabirds choose somewhere else to breed because of changing sea temperatures and forage fish distributions, then the singular objective of that MPA might not be met anymore. But you have to be able to kind of lean on other other reasons for that MPA to, con to continue to exist. Um, and in the other direction, like an MPA might be put in place to preserve an area that is not doing so well and it might improve with the help of interventions. Um, and so then you would be able to kind of increase your, increase the, the target to a, to a higher level. Um, but many of the plans that we look, looked at did have kind of an iterative management pattern. So they might say, this is the five-year management plan, and then we'll reassess um, using the mechanisms outlined in the, in, in the uh, management plan in in a given amount of time. And then we will look at whether or not to change what we're doing or keep doing what we're doing. Um, so it's kind of a, a learning by doing and continually updating um, framework. Yeah, I think that, that sort of fits into one of Dave Peeler's comments as, as uh, MPAs mature, they likely get better at being more specific in their objectives, measures mm -hmm. and actions they can take and how to respond to those. So that a, a, I'm not sure if that adaptive management loop sort of tightens up as the um, as those MPAs sort of mature. Um, Ron, uh, Ron, I was just going to add, share yeah, because I, I think there's yeah. something a little bit, um, you know, talking about objectives and either successfully meeting those objectives and or failing around those objectives because of unmanageable climate pressures is is really on the minds of a lot of people. Um, I had an opportunity to work with. Uh, NOAA colleagues at Impact 5, where we delivered a session on climate change and thinking about adaptation and a lot of the, the like topics that we're talking about in this paper and some of their work through the Marine Sanctuaries Program, so Lauren Wenzel and Zach Ganzino. Um, and the paper that we submitted as part of that conference was really focusing in on some of the broader frameworks that are out there to help resource managers, not just MPA managers, really think about, well, what what are the decision support systems or frameworks when um, when I do need to make a different choice when I when my objectives just aren't necessarily going to be achievable? Um, do we toss the whole baby out? With, right. That's, sorry, that's a horrible analogy. Um, <laughs> um, you know, is it, is it, I, and I don't I don't I don't think that there's any um, reason to just you know wash our hands and do something else. It's it's adapting, it's, you know, these, these places are important for multiple reasons, not necessarily just one, but we tend to sort of prioritize and highlight. And so it's really taking this ecosystem approach of the seabirds are here for, you know, 
a, a really good region. It, if the habitat suitability changes, it doesn't make that area, you know, necessarily less important from an ecological perspective. So we need to be thinking about it from that perspective, but we also need to be thinking about, are we going to make choices to direct, right, the, the adaptation? Are we going to start planting corals? Are we going to develop genetically modified organisms? Are we going to um, are we going to just accept the fact that there's change? And so there's these the RAD frameworks, the RKT framework, things like this are things that other people think about way more than I do. But I think bringing it in as a, a layer of things that we start to consider as we are understanding how our objectives might may or may not be changing through time um, is, is a really important part of the adaptive system that I'm not necessarily seeing being integrated either, right? So I really appreciate that question about the change over time because we need to start looking at what are what are the options when things don't work and what are the options when things like kind of go bananas, right? Um, what are we going to do when we are faced with uh, changes to the structure that we've currently laid out explicitly in these documents? So that's a really interesting area of work and other people are, are really focused on that outside of um, fisheries and oceans, I think. And, possibly within that I'm not aware of, so. <clears throat> Which I think that actually is a great segue into Ronald Tom's um, question about examples of active versus passive adaptive management and when those strategies differ yeah. depending on the conditions in or yeah. around the MPA. I think maybe that's a good, a challenging, it, not an easy answer, but. Uh, no, and I, I can't say I would have the answer. I think it's, I think it's pretty, I mean, it's probably locally relevant, right, in terms of what's going on, but just even to have a framework that is laid out so that there's some consistency in approach, um, you know, that's that's what I'm all about in terms of adaptation and, and our responses from a government perspective and a you know public service perspective is that Canadians it might expect there would be some consistency from one region to another in terms of how we generate advice and how we apply that advice and what our decisions are, how our decisions are made based on the type of information that we have available. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't, I think it's a very local issue and, but we still need the frameworks in order to guide. And so these are, I think this is what the literature in sort of risk assessment and the, these adaptation frameworks, RAD, RDT that I've mentioned, are starting to really go. And I think it would be very useful to look at those to begin guiding, um, you know, when do you actively manage and when do you passively manage within a proactive context, right? RAD right. and RDT <laughs> are a proactive context. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense, folks. I think so. I got, so I got a couple more questions. We've got a few more minutes before we have to wrap up, but this yeah. one's from the north side of the border from, from Morgan. Um, any discussions on um, this stuff with the province? So just, oh, sorry, my screen just slid away there. Ah. Um, when a new question gets popped in, it slides all the way back to bottom. So with the, with the province to incorporate the findings into some of the coast, their coastal management strategy, which I guess is less about a specific area, but a, a broader yeah. system. So I, I can speak to that a little bit. Kai, you, you know, Kai was the lead on finding the plans and has really the in-depth sense of, um, you know, the provincial situation. Do you want to speak to that for a minute? Um. Well, I'm not sure if the, if the question is asking whether or not we're engaging with the province to kind of deliver this information yeah. in order to support their. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, guess, I, I don't strategies. expect you to be able to comment on, on what they're yeah. doing. So I guess but you guys are engaging with them yeah. and sharing. I, I we would did say look at a lot of um, provincial management plans, not too many of the monitoring plans. Um, yeah, I, it didn't appear that they were taking a strong adaptive management approach <laughs> is kind of all I can say. Yeah, and I, I was recollecting that it was hard to find provincial plans um, mm -hmm. and the documentation. Yeah, the monitoring plans particularly, and, and that makes sense. They may not have, right, like there's reasons sometimes why these things yeah. don't exist, um, but, but management plans as well were um, sometimes hard to find. And um, from our perspective, yeah, that was that was sort of where 
where we landed in terms of being able to interpret what the province is doing um, mm -hmm. from a British Columbia perspective. I think Nova Scotia, you know, we didn't necessarily focus too much out there, but um, the Oregon paper. Anyway, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details. Sorry, my yeah, it's just so detailed where okay, I no, no. But yeah, I, I do, think yeah. I would love I would love for fisheries and oceans to engage on the province and for us to be working together so that the coastal strategy is matching the federal strategy or at least, you know, um, linking and integrating. I think that would be fabulous. And there's probably a lot of opportunities to do that. And I think the suggestion is is to get in touch with the oceans program and um, to begin conversations at that level, because they are the people who are responsible. Um, I'd be happy to put people in touch if that's um, a role that I could play to facilitate any of that going forward. Mm -hmm. I do want to note that that just because we couldn't find a monitoring plan doesn't mean that monitoring yes. isn't happening and there's a lot of evidence yeah. that there is really good work happening it's just that there isn't a document tying it all together right. so that people know what's happening and can yeah. can yeah uh, kind of and that's an important the government doesn't have one place where they have a yeah <laughs> right Talking. yeah and I I think over time like that's part of the adaptive cycle in terms of the transparency piece right um in that unless we are transparent around what we're doing it it you know it's it's hard to to be able to uh, summarize this sort of stuff but also passing it from across sectors and across the partners we need to work with and if we don't write the stuff down and formalize it to some degree it makes that job even harder because then you're relying on human brains to remember and pass off the information when somebody changes their job and all of our institutional constructs, which is work I'm doing actually with some colleagues in the fisheries management system to analyze our resilience from a climate change perspective for fisheries. It's really exploring how humans actually set up their systems and how it either facilitates or does not facilitate the transfer of knowledge, the transfer of uh, information, the, the data organization, all of those pieces start to matter from an institutional, from a governance perspective. So it really all fits together, but it's so much to take on. And so it's picking out the pieces, you know, that are, um, yeah, most bang for buck. Bite sized chunks, right? Yeah. Yeah, bite sized so, chunks and making yeah, progress no, I, over time. But, addressing yeah. climate change, having three or four people addressing climate change is <laughs> no small task. Um, yeah. So I think we'll, I'm going to pass it over to Marielle for any final comments. And I just, there was a couple yeah, interesting comments about the Cherry Point um, adaptive management, um, some interesting work going on there. So uh, encourage people to have a look at that and see some of their um, adaptation stuff of what they're looking at. Uh, so Marielle, anything from you to, to close us out? I believe we only have till 1.15 is our plan. Yeah, I think um, we probably have time for one more question. I love to see the the chat and the case studies and connections that are happening around um, emerging efforts and also around updates to examples like Cherry Point. Um, I, I did see a great question I want to touch on just as we, we yeah. give the importance of this topic, which is um, how do we see the roles of First Nations and tribes in marine protected areas and any reflections or insights either from this research or just more broadly that you all have on that? And then I'll close this out with some logistics. Yeah, I mean, I think Kai did a wonderful job sort of trying to highlight, you know, where in the social ecological objectives we can make some progress and and understanding from from my perspective that there are ways of monitoring, you know, that where we go out from a Western science perspective and we monitor and measure and incredibly important sets of data. There are other ways of knowing and um, making progress around how we incorporate, um, you know, centuries, <laughs> thousands of years of oral history and indigenous knowledge into, um, you know, what we know about these places and how we know about them, I think is, is really important from a Canadian perspective. Um, and, and it also works with and aligns with what we're finding that is lacking in these monitoring plans. And so it's, it's a win-win, I think, to move forward on, on that sort of piece um, together. Um, mm -hmm. How we do that is um, sort of outside of my particular purview, but I know that there are people who are really working hard to make progress uh, in that area um, and that it's a challenging area. And um, 
any any time I'm able to support as a public servant in my role, you know, to make that happen, that's where I step in. And I think that's the culture that um, we've been growing as well. And so, yeah, I, I see a brighter future than maybe um, what, what I once did. So I think that's what I'd like to say and sort of summarize around that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, both Karen and Kai, for joining us today. Uh, Mariel's just typed in the chat, there's a happy hour in Tacoma today. So um, hopefully anyone uh, on the south side of the border is able to join. Um, and there'll be a break on the Salish Roundtable until September. Uh, just many people in the field, and summer vacations, et cetera. So sea level rise is our next um, conversation, which sort of rolls into climate adaptation conversations that we're having today. So fantastic. And feel free to look in the chat. Um, lots of conversations and connecting people. Um, so I encourage everyone to take a look at that. At yeah, please, slide please, don't, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly too. I can connect you with Kaya, um, can direct you to people that I know or be, be happy to, to facilitate as much as I can. So please, yeah, don't hold back. Fantastic. I'm waiting for thanks. your emails. <laughs> <Good night. laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone.